a lot of prominent North Atlantic think tanks and media houses and our own left-leaning Indian intellectuals say that this law is going to undermine Indian democracy because it's communal and bigoted and that no other secular democracy has this kind of a draconian law. For them, I would just say, shut the fuck up. CAA is unconstitutional. Indian democracy is under threat. CAA is discriminatory. CAA targets Indian Muslims. If you hear people making these remarks, don't be mad at them. Just send them this video. Before we talk about the CAA, it's important to look at few numbers. Let's get some facts straight. Do you even know that the percentage of Hindu population in Pakistan reduced from 20% in 1947 to 3% in 2016? And by some metrics, it's less than 2% today. Similarly, in Bangladesh, Hindu population fell from 23% in 1971 to 9% in 2023. And in Taliban Afghanistan, it reduced from 700,000 Hindus in 1970s to zero Hindus today. Why did this happen? Well, the answer is pretty simple. In theocratic nations such as Pakistan, Taliban Afghanistan, and Bangladesh, religious minorities are either persecuted, forcibly converted, or made to flee. In most cases, this has been systematic ethnic cleansing. On the contrary, if you see, Indian Muslims grew from 35 million in 1951 to over 172 million in 2011, which is a four times increase. My intention behind quoting these figures is to let you know the fundamental difference between these three countries and India. Let's bring the CAA or the Citizenship Amendment Act into the frame, under which India is providing refuge and opening its doors to the religiously persecuted minorities that is Hindus, Buddhists, Sikhs, Parsis, Jains and Christians from these three Islamic nations. Speaking of the CAA, the burning question that arises is that why does it exclude Muslims? Well, the answer is pretty straightforward because Muslims in Islamic states cannot be persecuted on the basis of their religion. That's by first principle logic, right? Because they fall under the umbrella of an overarching Muslim identity. Second contention that arises is that how can India make a law based on religion? Now, you've got to be kidding me on this because India has several such laws. One popular example is the Muslim personal law. So this argument is completely baseless. Now, let me address the elephant in the room. When the basis of persecution is religion, the law providing relief with this regard is naturally going to be based on religion. Allow me to digress a little. Some so-called intellectuals in our country cite Article 14 and say that as per the Indian constitution, no law can be made that excludes or addresses people based on ethnicity or faith. Now, I want to remind you once again, this law is not for Indian citizens. That is, those who are already in the mold of Indian citizenship, including Indian Muslims, by the way, CAA has no impact on them. CAA is a law for foreigners, stateless refugees who arrived in India before December 2014 to include them by fast-tracking their citizenship into the larger mold. So all the sphere mongering that is happening, that CAA is going to denaturalize Indian Muslims, has no basis for it. Now coming to the next issue, a lot of prominent North Atlantic think tanks and media houses and our own left-leaning Indian intellectuals say that this law is going to undermine Indian democracy because it's communal and bigoted and that no other secular democracy has this kind of a draconian law. For them, I would just say, shut the fuck up. Because this is utter lie. The beacon of secularism as per the left, US, has its own version of the CAA, the 1989 Lautenberg Amendment, which provided refuge to Jews from the Soviet Union. Interestingly, this was later modified to include Christians, Baha'is, and Zoroastrians from Iran as well. Now, why didn't they include Muslims in this list? Does this make this law communal? Was the US government being discriminatory against Muslims of Iran by not fast-tracking their citizenship? No, because it makes no sense, right? And I can quote several other examples to you, including the jackson Bannock Amendment, Spectre Amendment, Contingent Refugee Resettlement of Germany, Sweden's Quota Refugees and Resettlement Scheme, and other provisions of fast-tracking, let's say, Hungarians after the revolution, or Cubans. The list goes on. The bottom line is, this kind of a law is not unique to India. Another very prominent issue is, and I guess Dr. Tharoor also alluded to it, is that what about homosexual Muslims in these countries, or atheists, or Muslims who are critical of their faith, such as Taslima Nasreen or Salman Rushdie? Aren't they vulnerable in such radically charged societies? Well, that's a very fair and legitimate argument. However, the good news is that these individuals can still apply for Indian citizenship using the normal course of the law, where no changes have been made. If they feel that India is a safer abode for them, and they are uncomfortable in the radical atmosphere in their own countries, they are welcomed to apply for Indian citizenship. An important caveat, however, on this is that, and I want to underscore it several times, 
is that given the bitter experiences of past cross-border terrorism, India has all the right to be apprehensive of the majority population in these states and consider them on a case-by-case -case basis. Last point that I want to touch upon is the same bogus argument that CAA is Hindu fascism, some calculated step towards saffronization project of India. Well, this is not true either because CAA has a very long historical context to it. The fact is, India was partitioned on religious lines and millions were dead in trying to cross the borders. At that point, those who got stuck in Pakistan, our own founding fathers, including the Mahatma, Nehru Patel and Maulana Azad, promised them safe refuge in India and citizenship in case Pakistani state fails to protect them. Now, one can rightfully argue that this law is in line with their aspirations. So what's the problem with this? I don't want to be too verbose now. I've presented all the facts for you on the table. Now you decide why aren't people getting their heads around this. Few days back, I listened to Sadhguru express his thoughts on this. And I want to drop that clip here because I can't think of a better way of closing this video. Seen as a proponent of them at a time when there were large scale protests. Four years later, Sadhguru, what do you feel about it? The government has decided to notify. The reason I ask is because it pertains to things like religion, faith, government. What it, do you think? It doesn't pertain to any religion. It is too little compassion coming too late. That's my description of CAA. Too little compassion coming too late. Because when we left people on the other side of the border post-partition, there was hope that they will be well taken care of. And there was also a promise in the political space that if there are problems, we'll take you back. But over seventy-five years, they have faced the worst of the worst. And many of them are moved here over thirty, forty years ago, and they're still refugees in this country. Are we not ashamed? Are we not ashamed that people are here an historical blunder where nations are divided and somebody fell on the wrong side of the line and they tried to correct it and they came over thirty, thirty-five years ago and still they don't have citizenship, they don't have any rights in our country. We should be ashamed of this. This is not a controversy. This is a matter of shame.